Good morning. Thank you for attending and welcome to today's presentation, Advancing Water Resiliency, Nature's Contribution to People and Agriculture. My name is Margot Hurlburt and I'm a Canada Research Chair in Climate Change Energy and Sustainability Policy and a professor here at Johnson Trayama's Graduate School of Public Policy. I research on water and sustainability. I'm also pleased to be your moderator for today's event. The Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we have swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS physical home is located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. This event could not take place today without the support of our organizing team made up of Ducks Unlimited Canada, the Regional Centre of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development, RCE Saskatchewan, and the Saskatchewan Alliance for Water Sustainability, SAWS. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event. Feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&As. The format for today's event is as follows. Our speakers will present for approximately 30 to 40 minutes. Following the presentation, our panel will entertain questions. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom's chat function to send your questions to myself, Margot Hurlbert, and I will pose your questions to our panelists. If you have any logistical questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Last Jaster LaForge via the chat function. Please note that as with all of our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. Now that the formalities are out of the way, I'm pleased to introduce to you today's panel. I'm going to go in reverse order of presentation. First, I will, I will introduce our last presenter, Vice Chief Heather Bear. The fourth Vice Chief, Heather Bear, is a member of Ochapaway's First Nation in Saskatchewan. She is a wife and mother of four children and most recently a grandmother. Prior to being elected to the Federation of Sovereign Ind Indigenous Nations as fourth Vice Chief, Heather had served as a council member of the Ochapaway's First Nation for six years. During her term of office, Heather has worked collectively for the betterment and advancement for all First Nations in the area of treaty implementation prioritized education as a treaty right and the foundation for our schools, ensured the development of First Nations youth to become the future leaders and continues the commitment to improving the life situation of First Nations people. Ian McCrary, owner and operator of McCrary Land and Livestock, LTD. Ian McCrary, together with his wife, two sons and daughter-in-law, own and operate McCrary Land and Livestock at Bladworth, Saskatchewan, just south of the border between Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 on Highway 11. Ian is currently serving as co-chair of a national task force with Farmers for Climate Solutions, reviewing and quantifying best management practices for mitigating the impacts of agriculture on greenhouse gases. Ian will review a number of approaches on their farm to improve the environmental outcomes and the associated challenges. Next, Dr. Paul Galperin is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Calgary, where he is a landscape ecologist and conservation biologist researching the sustainable intensification of cropping systems in Western Canada with an emphasis on the contributions of beneficial insects. Larry Durand is owner and operator of Feel Good Agronomics, a crop consulting business in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. He's been providing agronomic services to Humboldt for 22 years. Today, Larry will share a case study on the economics of farming marginal land. Alice Davis is a board member of Lower Coppell Watershed Stewards, Inc., formed in January 2010 while Alice was working with Cowess's First Nations Land Department. Alice is a resident of the lakeside village of Burt's Point, Many challenges face the six recreational lakes of this watershed, and Alice is proud to be part of changing the challenge, along with many friends of the Craven Dam 
to the Manitoba border. And Ora Lee McPherson, who grew up in the fabulous prairie town called Belcaris, and takes those prairie valleys she learned and weaves them into every project she undertakes. So before I turn the floor over to our speakers, I'm gonna just give a brief background to advancing water resiliency, nature's contribution to people in agriculture. In 1857, Cap Captain John Palliser came to the Great Plains and concluded it inhabitable and incapable of supporting a viable agricultural system. It is a land of extremes. It's extremely wet, extremely dry, extremely hot, extremely windy, extremely cold, and it's highly variable climate dampens the climate change signal. But since 1900, it's been getting drier and more recently, less cold. Indigenous people, Métis and settlers are resilient. A wealth of local, indigenous and scientific knowledge exists on the prairies, some of which we will hear today, but international knowledge also exists. Building on the first Earth Summit in Rio in 1992 and 2012, wherein the international community came together to address concerns surrounding the environment and development, 80 submissions by member states identified interconnected water, food, resilience, and social foundations, which later informed the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, in Agenda 2030. These SDGs recognize that 70% of the world's population depends on nature's contribution to people for their lives and livelihoods. An unhealthy environment imposes, imposes a huge risk on people. In the 21st century, the SDGs reflect our planetary boundaries, the safe operating space for humanity, measured in biodiversity loss, land use change, freshwater use, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. SDG 12 recognizes practices age old on the prairie landscape of connecting consumption and production practices sustainably. Indigenous Plains people are knowledge keepers of these sustainable practices surrounding water, SDG 6, land, SDG 15, and some of this knowledge will be shared with us today. SDG 17 is about partnerships, which our speakers are here today and emulating. Agricultural producers as land stewards know the prairies is a natural sink to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The land and maintaining its rich, healthy soils offers synergistic benefits to its symbiotically connected prairie water. Today, we will develop a pathway for tomorrow's resilience. So today we'll start hearing from our first panelist, Ora Lee. A warm welcome to everyone. Um, we're so excited. We have 320 people bouncing in. And so we're, we're very happy about that. So I'm going to get started. In 2015, uh -huh. Canada signed on to the United Nations 17 Goals of Sustainable Development, which means by default, Saskatchewan has signed on. So cities like Regina, Saskatoon, small, small towns like Valcaris, industries like agriculture have signed on. The United Nations 17 goals are there to build adaptation and resiliency to ensure our success. Angela Pratt, who works at the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, has taught me about the sacredness of water. When we respect the water, we respect the land, we respect the peoples. The science and the elders are telling us that our lakes, our rivers, our aquifers are stressed. One stressor is the nutrient loading coming off of agriculture. We use goal number 17 to organize this conference. Goal number 17 is all about partnering. We are leaning in today. We want success for our agricultural industry and weaving adaptation and resiliency will translate into a sustainable future for our waters and our peoples of Saskatchewan. Alice? Good morning and welcome to the Lower Capel Watershed Stewards located in southeastern Saskatchewan. The river flows through six major lakes, including Pasqua, Echo, Mission, Katepwa, Crooked and Round Lakes. Major tributaries include the Pearl, Indian Head, Red Fox, Ikapo, Cardarm and Scissor Creeks. We also have 16 towns, 29 villages, 16 First Nations, and many resort villages along the lakes. Economic activity within our watershed includes agriculture, tourism, potash mining, and oil and gas development. It doesn't matter what piece of land we own, 
We all have something in common, and that's managing the piece of land we live on, and we manage it to protect our environment. Here you will see even the turtles are doing the same. Our watershed, as determined by the 2010 State of the Watershed Report, is classified as stressed. These pictures show we may have a nutrient problem. Scientists are telling us that these blooms are happening more and more because of us. Remember when I said we all manage our lands no matter what we own? Adding phosphorus and nitrogen into a mix of nutrients that are keeping our water residents well fed year round disrupts this balance. Where are they coming from? Well, sometimes it comes naturally from the soil or from decaying plant matter, but far too often it's coming from us. For example, fertilizing our lawns. It's hard to imagine that we can have an impact on a water body the size of a lake, but we do. Scientists are also showing us that water runoff into our lakes, rivers, and streams also has a lot to do with excess nutrients getting there. The lake kind of acts as a collecting bed for these nutrients because water flows across the ground from snow melt and heavy rains and collects in lakes. What we do in our watershed on the land influences what happens to our water. Remember, according to the State of the Watershed Report, our watershed is already stressed. But what about non-point source of nutrients? We partner with the Global Institute for Water Security to undertake a report of the land use and water quality. No one has undertaken a study like this before. The report assessed the potential impact of various benefit management practices in the Lower Capel. This report is a screening level assessment of the potential impacts of BMP and is limited by the lack of data on the effects of management at relevant scales in environmental conditions and attempts to tackle one of the most difficult areas in watershed management, estimating efficiencies of BMPs in nutrient reductions from data limited watershed. Given the data limitation, the report represents the best possible assessment of BMP impact, but it should be seen as representation of what we might see rather than what we will see. Oh, we're advancing along here pretty fast. <laughs> Watershed management, <clears throat> wetland restoration, although there are many management options discussed in this paper, we will look at wetland restoration and watershed management. Most of our runoff comes from snow melt in the spring. At this time, soils are frozen and plants are dormant, so nutrients don't get used. They can only be stored or allowed to flow downstream. Wetlands store spring runoff and nutrients are removed when the plants grow later. Drainage removes the water storage function, so nutrients flow downstream rather than being retained on the lawn. With less wetlands, more water with phosphorus flows downstream. If we re reverse, this, reverse this and restore wetlands, the opposite happens with more nutrients that are kept out of our lakes and rivers. Restoring wetlands is a simple procedure. By constructing an earth plug in the ditch, a wetland can be fully restored within just a few years. LQWS and ducks have programs that can assist producers in restoring their wetlands. Thank you from the Laura Capel Watershed Stewards. Thanks, Alice. Now, Larry. Okay, thanks, Margo. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, go through a, a quick case study that I did with uh, one of my customers here a few years back so on the economics of farming saline land. And this could be extrapolated to any marginal land, but I want to talk about salinity particularly. And this is a, you know, we're talking a lot about water here and how does salinity and water tie together? Well, salinity is, as many of you know, a water problem and it occurs when there's a high water table and conditions uh, where there's evaporation exceeding precipitation. And so under those circumstances, those, that water is seeping up to the surface and evaporating and what's left behind are those salts uh, that adversely affect uh, plant production. 
And uh, as many of you know, salinity is not a uniform problem in a field. Uh, oftentimes we'll have some areas in a field that uh, are, are non-saline where they produce really well, areas that have some moderate salinity that, that affect the yield, and then some really bad areas where there's absolutely no production whatsoever. So keep this, uh, this little picture in mind here as we go through some of this analysis going forward. And um, I'm breaking the rules of PowerPoint 101 here by uh, th throwing up all these numbers, but uh, you don't have to know all this. Just, I'll, I'll point out a few things here just to show some trends. So this is from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture's Crop Planning Guide uh, for the Black Soil Zone. And what it does is that it, it gives farmers an idea of uh, what the, they can expect for different crops. So in the case of spring wheat, they could expect in the black soil zone to have an average yield of about 65 uh, bushels per acre. And then an estimate of the input costs is a total of 238.93. Uh, so if you look at the gross revenue minus those input costs, you would have a benefit of $176 per acre. If we look at a areas where there's a bit of salinity where your yield drops down to 37 bushels per acre, that's where your costs, your revenue basically just covers your costs. So if we think of that previous picture where we're dropping down to 25 bushels, we're losing $78 per acre and those areas where there's no yield whatsoever, it's a, you know, just about a 240 bushel, uh, pardon me, dollar per acre loss because all those expenses are yielding nothing. So what we're looking at here is the case study is what if we remove those areas that aren't productive and seed it to say a grass, a salt tolerant grass. So here I have two maps. Uh, they're called SWOT map or the one on the right is called a SWOT map, soil, water and topography map. But we start off with this on the left, the conductivity map. And you'll notice on the left here where there's the darker colors, that's areas that have a real salinity problem and it's right along a ditch. And so what we do is that we take this conductivity map and through various extrapolations, we make this zone map that we use to make prescriptions, but it's these really dark green areas right here where the salinity is the, uh, the big problem. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna remove these acres here, but that's up to 43, but for this, this analysis, we're actually gonna remove 50 acres because farmers like a nice straight line. So there's gonna be some extra acres taken out. So once we remove these 50 acres from production, we go from 627 acre field to a 577 acre field. The yield goes from 64.7 to 69 because we've taken out those worst producing areas. And so the gross revenue, because we have less acres, will go from 260 to 255. So we've actually have $5,000 less wheat to market at the end of the year. However, when we go to the, to the input costs part of the equation, we're going from $150,000 to 138,000. So we're actually saving $11,000 worth of costs here for a net benefit of $6,600 on this one section. Now that's just for wheat on one field. So if a farmer would do this on his or her entire farm, they could really benefit from a lot of, of uh, profitability. And I've done this analysis for more than just wheat, other crops that are common in the black soil zone, canola, uh, you actually on this same field would see about a $10,500 benefit because it's, uh, it's a higher input cost crop and it's more sensitive to salinity. Barley would be about 7,300 and peas would be about $9,000 benefit. So uh, it doesn't matter which crop you're gonna grow there. If you take out those 50 acres, put it to grass, uh, you're gonna have a benefit. There's some other benefits, benefits besides just the profitability on the farm. Uh, there's some environmental benefits and this ties in very well with today's presentation. Uh, healthy riparian areas, which uh, Alice just talked about the importance of having good riparian areas. Uh, it can also be very good habitat for wildlife for beneficial insects. And of course, the carbon sequestration potential for a perennial cover, as opposed to an annual crop is much better. Um, for uh, those who are familiar with canola production, club root can be a crippling disease. And so uh, having a perennial cover, especially near field entrances 
uh, can be a good uh, management tool to prevent club root establishment. Uh, oftentimes those saline areas are areas where weeds like kochia and uh, foxtail barley are a problem. So it could be, we could take care of those weeds by having ground uh, grass grown there. We could also, by having more, uh, more productive uh, vegetation there can actually draw down the water table and draw down those salts and improve that land. And again, there's maybe even more profitability if you sell that forage or, uh, or you know, rent out the grazing. That's all I want to talk about. So just wanted to point out, uh, I guess, finish off by saying the benefits, uh, you know, they check a lot of boxes. It's economically beneficial, it's agronomically beneficial, and it's environmentally beneficial. Now, this is just an excerpt of a, of a, a presentation that I put together a few years ago that normally it takes me about 45 minutes. But if you'd like to see the full analysis, uh, you can go to my website. Uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint is there for you, uh, for you to see. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll uh, on to, I believe... Thank you, Larry. And we're going to hear from Dr. Galprin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm really going to continue on um, from the point that Larry made so well. And I'm going to talk about the power of messy fields. And when I see this field, which is actually in Northern Alberta, I see a lot of potential. I see a lot of things happening. Now you might see where that farmer, that grower has driven circles around these patches of trees, but I wanna look into those trees. I wanna look into those habitats and talk a little bit more detail about what they might provide, what contribution they might make to people. And in turn, what that, uh, how that might incentivize growers to take places like this out of production or keep them out of production. So, you know, looking at the top picture there on the left, that is a uh, tidy, uh, a tidy field, I would call that. Um, it, there, there's, there's actually a lot, there's 16 of those tidy fields. There's really not much going on in that landscape. But if you look on the one below, um, in terms of, uh, of, of natural places, if you look at the, the map below, you see that there are lots of wooded areas, there's wetlands, there's a pasture area to the uh, top left of the map, there's shelter belts along the right and the bottom. Those are the wild places, what I call the messy spots and the spots where nature's contribution to people can actually happen. And when we say nature's contribution to people, we're also, we're also talking about uh, a concept called ecosystem services, which has been around for a bit longer than this, this newer term, nature's contribution to people. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the potential for these spots, these green, greener areas, the wetlands, the forested patches, to provide things like pollination to canola crops or pest control. The spiders might live there and march out into the field and eat the bad guys. Or what about the trees? They can store carbon or the perennial grass in their deep, deep roots. And then what today is about the potential for these greener areas to be sponges, to play a role in water quality and regulation. And then finally, to support habitat, habitat for a whole host of other organisms. So let's just look a little bit deeper in how these messy places, the bits in the field the farmer needs to drive around, the places that might emerge after uh, Larry's prescription to take that land out of production is, is realized, what is actually going on there? And I would call them hot spots for ecosystem services. So in that grass around this wetland in southern Alberta, we've got habitat for beneficial insects, the bees, the spiders, the beetles. And then they might march out into the field and eat the, uh, the, 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 the bad guys, the crop pests. And then that grassy area, fabulous spot for um, carbon sequestration and storage in the deep grassy roots. Uh, and then into the wetland itself, water quality improved by the plants, the insects, the microorganisms that live in that wetland. And then finally, 
the water regulation potential of these sloughs, these wetlands that cover the entire prairies. They temporarily store water, they can recharge that aquifer, and they provide a pulse buffer when you have that extreme weather event. So I hope I've briefly made the point that there is value in terms of the services and the contributions that messy fields, that bits in the field that the farmer needs to drive around, they might have value. And growers want to remove things like wetlands and forest patches and fence rows and pasture lands precisely because they get in the way. They like straight lines, as Larry says, they minimize turning with machinery. But, you know, what if there is, as Larry says, profit to be made from actually removing these areas from production and allowing them to be messy? Let's create that argument for you here. If a farmer chooses to allow his or her field to be messy, to retain, to restore, and maybe even to create new messy places in the field, well, as we've already learned today, there's the potential to save. You take marginal land out of production, you pay, pay less uh, in terms of your inputs, and you actually save if you create a new space, and that results in increased profit. But then there's the other piece that my lab at the University of Calgary focuses on, that's that potential to deliver pest control and other ecosystem services like pollination. And my lab has shown that features like wetlands in the middle of quarter sections can be reservoirs, places for bees and spiders and beetles to make their home and march out into the field and contribute to crop yield. And that in turn might incentivize growers to take more of uh, these places out of production or to create or retain existing messy places. But why do all this stuff? Well, it's all about these other services. It's all about water regulation that these sponges might provide, water quality improvements, carbon storage, then of course habitat and sustainability. And this all is wrapped around something that farmers care about. It's a social license to operate. And if you can show that your operation is sustainable and perhaps even that these areas slightly improve your profit, suddenly we've got an economic case for improving the ecosystem services of this land. Uh, I'm running out of time. So I just wanna make, just summarize the one major point that my research, that, that, that's from, from my research of my lab, that really is relevant to this. We looked at all across Alberta, we had yield data from about six different years, and we can show that across this grand scale of Alberta, across multiple years, that fields that have more of this messy stuff in them are also slightly more productive. They have a higher yield per acre, canola fields, wheat fields, barley fields, pea and oat fields all have what I would call this positive effect of having uncultivated stuff in your field. It affects yield. So that's all part of this story. It's all part of retaining, restoring, creating new messy places and having that influence crop yield and profit that in turn incentivizes growers to create more of these places. And in turn, that has the residual benefit of water regulation, water quality, carbon storage, habitat, and ultimately sustainability. And that's a potential for win-wins at a grand scale across the entire prairies. And that's exciting. That's what gets me out of bed every morning. And that's the power of messy fields. Thanks to those who have sponsored our work, Ducks Unlimited, Canola Council of Canada in particular. Thank you, Paul. That gets you up in the morning and how to achieve that total map keeps me awake at night. So over to Ian. Uh, anyway, uh, to follow up to Paul, um, McCrary Land and Livestock at Bladworth, Saskatchewan. And uh, we have a very messy farm to follow up on Paul's uh, presentation. Um, this picture is a picture that is not current. Uh, thankfully, we don't have that much snow yet. Um, it's probably three years old because we haven't had that much snow for two or three years. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I are the fourth generation uh, on this land uh, from our family. And uh, so it's, it's got a lot of roots in being messy. 
um, early on in our marriage, just want to bounce, Karen. Early in our marriage, uh, we identified and wrote down uh, our three business objectives for our farm. And they essentially were financial, uh, lifestyle, and environmental. On the financial side, it's pretty straightforward. Every investment we made has to have a rate of return that reflects the risk of that investment. The lifestyle goal was my wife simply saying, Ian can't plan to work 365 days a year. And it turns out that breaks are good both for our marriage and the business of the farm. The environmental one uh, is, is something that's evolved over time. When we started out, our environmental objective was simply to leave the, the uh, soil and the landscape in as good or better shape than what we had taken it on from either our ancestors or from people that we bought the land. Over time, uh, this, um, this environmental objective has expanded to include trying to understand greenhouse gas implications of the choices we make. And as we get older, it seems that the, the importance of those environmental outcomes have become something that's growing in importance to us. So, as a result of having specifically environmental objectives, we've had a number of actions on our farm uh, over the course of our lives that have been driven principally from the environmental protection. The, the first uh, was the decision to move to solar power. Um, we put in a solar array that has the capacity to produce enough power for our farm and has the capacity to include the expansion of a solar vehicle or an expansion of an additional uh, building structure or other. So we're slightly over capacity on that side right now. The maintenance of wetlands, and, and Paul's talked about this in a great deal, um, is, is something that has been around for two, two past generation. And essentially what we have done uh, initially um, because my parents and grandparents have insisted on it for uh, primarily for issues of biodiversity. Um, but over time, we have done more reading and learned the importance of those wetlands, both from a, a water quality perspective, as well as from a greenhouse gas by avoided conversion. Those wetlands, and when you get in, when we get into some of the, the maps that I'll show you a little later, you can see the dominant place. On total for our farm, we farm about 3,000 acres and we have protected about 285 acres of wetlands that are push, that are treed at least in part. Um, so so it's a it's a been a fairly big commitment uh, that is higher on the lands that we've owned longer. Some of the lands that we've taken over uh, the wetlands had been largely plowed down before we took them on. The sectional control of fertilizer, it's got it both an agronomic as an economic as well as an environmental outcome. The, and they mirror each other very much. Uh, we use liquid fertilizer. So the, uh, the, the capital cost of moving to sectional control was, was very modest. Um, and when we get into seeing some of the maps, you'll see why it matters. But um, the economic return very much mirrors the uh, environmental outcome. Because if you can avoid overlap by controlling your drill in smaller sections as to where the fertilizer is applied, you reduce nitrogen overlap, therefore reducing nitrous oxide and, um, and excess application of fertilizer, which presumably will also uh, reduce the uh, migration of that with water flows. The, the last one, and it's one I want to uh, focus on a bit more, is soil mapping. And Larry has introduced you to soil mapping. And let me just advance the slide. The, 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 um, we are convinced that, um, Karen, can you just move ahead there? We're convinced that advancing um, in agriculture in order to continue to feed the world and to protect the environment 
means we have to do a better under job of understanding our soils and the biodiversity that exists within those soils. And we have moved to um, what's called soil, water, and topography maps, which is a is a group that um, is uh, a specific agronomic team. We interviewed all the agronomy teams that provide different mapping techniques. It was our view that this approach had the best scientific package for both environmental as well as economic outcomes for our farm. Um, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of layers to a SWOT map. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to four of those layers and uh, particular to one half section that I find quite interesting. This half section is on number 11 highway and it has number 11 highway running through it at a 45 degree angle. I call this an urbanites projection because uh, this projection is sort of, as you would imagine this, uh, this field would look driving from Regina to Saskatoon. All of the black areas that you see are treed wetlands. Paul, that's our mess. Uh, note the large area in the southwest corner of the east, just on the east side of the highway, is, is a very massive uh, area that we've walked away from as a wetland. Uh, that was almost entirely farmed prior to the construction of the four lane highway from Saskatoon to Regina, which changed the water flow. And with the increased salt use on that highway, that is a drain that runs a little over four miles from the northwest down the highway and we're at the base of that drain so that area has become more salty and more boggy as a result of the runoff from the highway. The next map which will show the electrical conductivity and and Larry alluded to this earlier electrical conductivity just advance one there Karen Electrical conductivity um, is a pretty good measure of salinity in a field and therefore an inverse measure of, of um, fertility. Oh, I think Karen, yeah, there we are. And um, the, you can see that the remaining salinity that we've got in that area. Now we, we had Lamore salinity uh, previously, but we've, we had uh, about 40 acres along that highway in permanent cover for seven years. So this is following that period and you can see there's still a, very, a skim right along the edge that has the salt uh, from the highway. We really need SAS farmers to or SAS people to learn how to drive on ice so we can park those salt trucks. But uh, you can see that the, the salinity effect there. And then if you take the topography data and the salt data, and they have a couple other variables that they build into a SWOT map. It builds the zone maps, which is the next map, um, which uh, the agronomist, people like Larry, work with the farmers to go out and, uh, and ground truth the empirical data they have on the field. And based on that empirical data uh, and the ground truthing exercise, we develop zones which are, are probed separately for different uh, fertility levels. And in turn, that develops a fertility prescription for the field, which determines how much fertilizer goes on according to need. Karen, you can just advance the zone map. So the zone map, and you can see when she combines, when the map combines the topography and the salinity, uh, they have 10 zones, those zones are grouped. And, and once we've sort of ground truth that by driving together, then uh, that drives the soil fertility. Now, you guys have all given up your morning to talk about water. So I wanted to just overlay the zone map with what would be the water uh, movement map on that half section. And um, you can see because of the trees and the wetlands, all of the water moves are quite localized and therefore if you do the field accumulate the flow accumulations, they're very minimal. Uh, we've got no eroded water runs on that land um, because we've got limited flow because each of the drainage catchment areas are separate. The exception is that that central piece along the east field, 
Uh, and in part, that water comes from the highway, but it also comes from the, just the topography that gives us a fairly large basin. And we do end up with, with more flow there. The um, island just to the east of that, or sorry, just west of that heavy flow area, uh, the area there will in, in wet years become a bit of an island. So that, that gives you a sense of, of how we can limit the overall flow of water with the preservation of these wetlands. So in concluding, um, I just wanna say, and I'm sure as you would expect, uh, our goals um, don't all move in the same direction all the time. And among the five participants in our farm, everyone's bought into the, all the goals. No one wants to leave the environment in worse shape than what we got it. Uh, no one wants a bad lifestyle. But the returns on our, everybody's outcome is determined by the returns of the farm. And so that leads to situations where if the economic income outcome differs from the environmental outcome, uh, it makes uh, decisions more difficult. And you know, so if, if fertilizer is very, very cheap, then the uh, benefits of additional mapping go down. Um, if uh, you're in a period where fertilizer is relatively more expensive, then the economic value of that mapping goes up and the, and the goals become more aligned. Our historic goal of protecting all of the wetlands comes under pressure all of the time. And the reason is for that is that in all the dry years, it's, it would be possible to farm straight through all those wetlands. And if we were to push the push, as is the case with most of our neighbors and destroy the wetlands, probably six out of 10 years, we could farm straight through much of that half section. So um, that, as we look across the way that, uh, you know, the pressure on that one is, is real and you watch as more neighbors make that decision. So um, I think that as we go from this place forward, uh, I would say there's there's two things we should conclude. The first is that we need better measures for the environmental outcomes in order to be able to uh, juxtapose their their outcomes with the with the uh, lifestyle and the driving economic objectives that exist on every farm. And secondly, where farming practices or research identifies best practices for the environment but the economics are not there for good adoption. We need a partnership between the public sector and the farm community to encourage adoption or to stop the um, spreading of bad practices. And I think that that's in our grasp and at least part of that has to be a really good wetlands policy. Wetlands. I'll leave it there for now and we can move on to Heather. Thank you. And Vice Chief Bear. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Is it morning or afternoon? Oh, no, it's good morning. Uh, first of all, before I begin, I want to acknowledge our Heavenly Creator today and uh, uh, all the uh, knowledge keepers, the elders that have uh, uh, been so... Uh, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, willing to offer their, their knowledge, the oral tradition, uh, not only for Indigenous people, but for all people, for all mankind. Uh, and today I am on Ochapoy's First Nation in the Treaty 4 uh, territory. Uh, it's beautiful here, and, and uh, I want to thank all the, my, the previous speakers, the organizers, and, uh, and uh, I want to... Uh, mention uh, maybe the FSIN, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. We work uh, to advance, you know, our inherent and treaty rights. We advocate and uh, promote and uh, look to full implementation of the original spirit, the intent of treaty, and how it pertains to the land and the people. When we talk about uh, advancing water resili resiliency, I, I want to maybe change uh, the narrative a little bit to uh, reflect the perspectives of our Indigenous peoples, our First Nations peoples. Um, you know, we've always lived here. 
And when we talk about uh, treaty and inherent rights, I want to point to inherent rights being those rights that have been bestowed upon us by the creator. And when we talk about water, uh, there's a role of the woman. And the woman, uh, in terms of our uh, natural law, she has been uh, responsible for the sacred, she has a responsibility <clears throat> and it's a sacred responsibility to protect the water. And when we look at uh, women as water carriers, uh, when, we, when, we're, when we're with child and the water breaks, there's life. So with that becomes many teachings and many rules and laws to live by. And uh, as we move into, you know, the times of uh, the days of treaty, and uh, we do have our uh, uh, partnership, it's a mutual relationship, a relationship that was originally made with the crown. And of course, uh, uh, in the oral tradition, we talk about living in harmony with our white brothers and sisters. And through the spirit and intent, we know that the original uh, intention was to live in harmony and to share this land. So when we look at sharing this land and uh, when we talk about it, advancing water resiliency, <clears throat> uh, I want to point to, uh, I guess, the, uh, in, in the areas of industry, whether it be farming, oil and gas, et cetera, whatever it is, um, that we have uh, uh, in this day and age in order to uh, create a livelihood uh, poses some threats, I guess, to say it bluntly, when we look at uh, what we're giving up and what there is to compromise uh, when we look at uh, the condition of the water. Uh, there's been many dams in the past. There's been many uh, uh, influences that have been... Uh, a negative and have put, uh, you know, the world out of balance, our land out of balance. And of course, the impacts uh, we're seeing more and more, uh, especially when you talk to the, uh, to the, you know, the elders, you know, we still have people, First Nations people, Indigenous peoples that live off the land. I want to point to this particular summer as I, uh, took advantage of the uh, silver lining of COVID for me was to go out to the land and live on the water. And uh, I did a lot of fishing and uh, I had the opportunity to talk to many elders and, uh, and what they've seen in the last 30 or 40 years, and even more than that, uh, some 50, 60 years. Uh, I've spent time in South End Pelican Narrows, uh, uh, Grandmother's Bay, you know, Larange, uh, uh, Cumberland House Delta. You know, I've, I've been on all these waters and they're all unique. I've been to uh, 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 again. And you know, there's, uh, there's a concern out there uh, regarding the condition. This year we've been, we were faced with uh, high levels, high levels of waters. Uh, you know, we, um, we look at, uh, when we look at the people and how it has impact, especially our young people, those, those little fishing holes that our young people usually go to, uh, you know, with the water running faster, we've lost lives, uh, in two days. One day I was at a search for a six-year-old little boy in Makwasa, Kayagan. Uh, the next day I was a, at a funeral in Sucker River. Uh, for another six-year-old boy, and uh, and that's devastating. And in each of those uh, situations, it had to do with the water levels changing, and uh, these things happening. So I I want to point that out because uh, uh, you know these are the impacts. Uh, you know what's going out there you know, with the water and, and the watersheds. And uh, you look at these announcements, for example, the Diefenbaker Irrigation Project, these kinds of uh, projects carrying on without consultation. And, uh, you know, we know that uh, the United Nations Declaration 
talks about free prior and in, in informed consent and um, you know consultation that uh, really needs to uh, we really need to take a serious look in, in how we're going about projects and making changes and uh, and I know by the previous presentations that uh, we do have more in common than not and I appreciate that, uh, you know, the protection of the land and the water. But, uh, you know, it, it, for me as a, uh, a vice chief, and I, I, uh, I'm in charge of the uh, mandates for the, the chiefs in, in Saskatchewan when it comes to lands and resources, and also uh, economic development. So when you're looking at, you know, protecting and preserving the land, and then on the other hand, you're looking at that inherent right uh, to self-determination, that inherent right to do business, you know, to assert our sovereignty and um, find ways to uh, make a livelihood and, and bring prosperity uh, to our people. You know, you're looking at there again, at what cost you know, and what impact when it comes to the land, the water, the animals, the, uh, the birds, and our people. In our conversations throughout uh, uh, my time, uh, you know, there's different, uh, let's just point to the Cumberland House Delta. We have about 10,000 square miles of uh, uh, wetlands, and it's a very important uh, a landscape, a, a important water. And uh, uh, the, my last conversation with uh, one of the knowledge keepers and uh, his name is Gary Carrier and he's uh, just a wonderful um, uh, man of the land. He speaks for the water in that area. And, and right now they're concerned in the next 30 or 40 years, we may look, be looking at one big river and uh, one of the biggest deltas in the world and how important it is uh, you know, to protect that. And, and today we have no policies, no laws, special laws to protect that place as we, uh, um, you know, and understand that's one of the biggest migration um, areas in the world. And, uh, uh, you know, there's species there that exist that are practically extinct in the world when you, you look at uh, uh, some of the findings and the studies that have been done. Uh, I'm sure uh, the universities are of, aware of that special uh, wetland and we need to do more to protect that and also be cognizant of, uh, you know, the uh, irrigation, the dams, all the, all the uh, changes, you know, upriver are really impacting what's happening there. So on, on a um, uh, on a serious note, uh, I think uh, uh, this opportunity and uh, the audience here today, uh, please uh, study the Cumberland House Delta. And uh, when we look at, uh, you know, our elders, we have uh, people that still live and survive off the land. And my worry is that treaty and inherent right, and right for our people to hunt, fish, gather, and, uh, uh, you know, get when we talk about gathering medicines, there's medicines there in their purest form. There's, uh, there's so many impacts, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, the culture is, uh, uh, is at risk uh, in terms of uh, our ability to do that. So in a healthier way, I, before I, I know I might be, just give me a little uh, nod here if I'm, I'm taking too much time, but there's so many cautions to talk about uh, when we talk about protecting, you know, the birds, the, the, the animals, the water, our life's blood. We need to uh, talk about the people and the impacts of pesticides. I, I want to point to maybe 2010 in, in our area when we had massive flooding uh, massive flooding occurred and we know we had uh, some, some uh, panic. Uh, I live in a valley, in the Coppell Valley, and there was a lot of, uh, um, uh, 
you know, diverting water. Uh, farmers were diverting water and it was getting into our watersheds. And of course, uh, uh, we experienced a, a few floods here around that era. Um, but I, I also want to point to the cancer, the cancer that has, uh, 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 I believe is turning into an epidemic uh, for our people. And of course, uh, First Nations Indigenous peoples, when we uh, decided which land we would keep back for ourselves, uh, a lot of that land is around water. So uh, I would really like to see the universities look at, uh, you know, um, I would love to see a, a study done on uh, cancer in these kinds of uh, uh, diseases that are, are, are showing up. Myself, I was diagnosed last year with stage four cancer. And uh, uh, I'm thankful, you know, for the elders, for the knowledge keepers that we do have medicines and my medicine came from the, the Cumberland House Delta. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, um, how important it is to protect these kinds of places and it's all over our medicines is all are, are all over but uh, there's so much um, contamination you know, all over our region, all over our, our country, that there's only certain spots now that we can really get the, the full power uh, of the medicines and uh, so that uh, it can do what it's intended to do. But my worry is, you know, we start contaminating, we, uh, we, we continue doing what we're doing, we won't have that. So uh, water is life. Water is something that um, I hold uh, dearly as a, the voice you know, for the woman. Uh, I do carry my headdress in honor of the first lawmaker, Mother Earth. And uh, I appreciate, you know, the science. And uh, I'll continue to advocate for the voice of our uh, elders. And I, I look to the day, my... my uh, Vision is the day will come when I don't have to fight to validate that our elders' voice is true. And there's many teachings through our oral traditions uh, that are beginning to resonate. And I really do appreciate this platform, this uh, uh, panel, uh, you know, to talk about what's important. And, uh, and uh, I really want to, again, uh, repeat that... Uh, you know, these elders, the knowledge keepers uh, that uh, give me, uh, you know, the, the knowledge to pass on. It's not just for our First Nations people. Again, it's for all mankind. So with that, thank you. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, getting a copy of this presentation and sharing it uh, with uh, uh, the chiefs in our region. Thank, Thank you, you so much for those words, Vice Chief Heather Bear. So I, I think Vice Chief uh, Bear has raised something interesting that perhaps some of our panel members want to discuss. We talked a lot about fertilizer, but we did not talk about pesticides. So I know we have some deep experience on the panel in relation to this. Uh, so I'll open it up to the panel if they want to address our concerns on pesticides in relation to water and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. I think nobody wants to I touch this have a poll here. Um, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll make a quick comment and you know, I, I want to, uh, I guess, uh, start by saying I'm not a toxicologist. And so I want to be very clear about that, that uh, these, uh, some of my comments might be more, uh, more emotionally based and scientifically based. I know that today's uh, pesticides, or we like to call, call them crop protection products in the ag industry, um, are not near as harmful as they used to be. Uh, that being said, uh, they still need to be used uh, judiciously. Each product, when they are registered, uh, they are registered with certain uses. And uh, one of those uses is the, uh, the distance 
that it can be applied uh, relative to waterways. And so farmers need to keep that in mind when they're applying. And, and that's probably, I, I think farmers have done a wonderful job in being good stewards of the land and good stewards of the environment, but we could always do better. And, and I think that's probably one place where it can be improved is um, how close we are uh, applying a lot of those pesticides uh, to the uh, to waterways. If I can jump in, I think um, you know the the the, the there, there's a great potential um, to reduce pesticide usage in fields by taking advantage of the natural pest control services provided by um, the animals that are already living in the fields. Um, and there's been a lot, of, a lot of work in agronomy looking at these, what they're called beneficial, beneficial arthropods like spiders or, or beetles. Um, now, you know, the, the, the argument is, are you still going to be able to produce the yields that you might have otherwise done by relying on, on these beneficials alone? And uh, I don't think anybody is trying to make that case, but I think there's a great potential for the reduction of these agrochemicals uh, in water by, um, by relying uh, more on uh, natural ways of controlling pests in fields. Maybe one more quick comment I'll make uh, <clears throat> on this front is something that I've noticed uh, in, in, my, in my work is um, farmers, I think, have to, in a lot of cases, be more tolerant of having a few weeds. And the use of economic thresholds is very common when dealing with insect problems and, and using insecticides. So they, 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 there's some really good established thresholds for if I have so many of this type of insect, then I should control them. If, if it's below that threshold, I don't need to. Um, when it comes to weeds, you know, I, I know so many farmers, they just want to kill every weed out there. And uh, with, when I do my work with farmers, you know, I, I pay very close attention. And I'll tell them, you know what? Yeah, you do have some of some wild oats out there, but not enough that you need to spend money on a pesticide and it's really not going to hurt your yield. So I think it's a reevaluation of, uh, of expectations uh, and uh, to... That, that would give an, another opportunity to reduce the use of, uh, of these crop protection products. Thank you for that. So I'm also interested in, uh, there's some questions in the chat about how we're going to uh, make change and very many around how we're going to value nature's contribution, how we're going to actually value water. Some people in the chat have asked around a wetland policy and whether our wetland policy should be the same as Alberta's or should it be different? Should valuation of wetlands be in our wetland policy? Any panel members have ideas on making this cultural change? I, I do have a suggestion. All right. Uh, I Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that uh, uh, question. I think that's uh, uh, one that uh, right now with uh, Cumberland House uh, First Nation uh, Chief Renee Chaboyer, um, they have, uh, uh, there's a lot of movement there and they're doing a lot to, uh, uh, with science and with elders. And uh, I would point to consultation with, uh, you know, the, the peoples that live in, in the wetlands, there's uh, uh, people who actually live right on, on, on the land in the Cumberland House Delta. <clears throat> so I, I would st start there first because uh, uh, you would be amazed by, you know, the suggestions. They know the land, they're there, they know the changes and they know not uh, why and how it should be protected. So I would start there with the people. So starting with protecting our, our existing wetlands and any mm -hmm. ideas on how to uh, protect some of these messy areas that we've been talking about in the panel. So taking what is currently a 
monotonous or homogenous piece of land and creating the messy areas that we're looking for. Yeah, Maro, I, I can come in on. I think there's, there's sort of three levels of discussion here. The first is that we do have some drainage policy out there that needs to be enforced. So drainage is happening that isn't approved and we need it to stop. Um, the second is that for existing wetlands that are vulnerable to destruction, um, there's money flowing into agriculture in various ways, and this would be a better way for it to flow in. For those wetlands that are there and need to be protected, or should be protected, frankly, I think most of them should be protected. If the government's paid and some of the resources that they put into agriculture went into protecting those existing wetlands, I think we could stop the destruction of existing wetlands. It's a higher investment to create those wetlands where they've been uh, in the past. And I think there's there's a number of areas where uh, that investment needs to come in. But I, that's sort of the, the third tier. And probably we need, uh, we need a bit of a targeted approach there to figure out where the most value can be created because the action of doing it will be quite expensive. So I think we have to figure out where the most important areas are to make that happen. Perhaps some of those are where illegal drainage happened and people should be held accountable to do it themselves and put it back in. Um, but other areas where um, it's a bit too far in history and there may have been three or four different landowners since that happened, uh, we're probably gonna have to have some significant public investment to make it happen. I, I, Margo, I wonder if, if, if we can't, when trying to value um, a wetland, uh, particularly in fields, if we cannot take some inspiration from cities, cities across Canada and across the world that um, have, have policies related to what they call natural infrastructure. So that's the kind the word that's used in urban contexts to describe green spaces, to describe uh, blue spaces, if you like, wetlands and, and rivers and riparian areas. Uh, and they value them um, through a number of lenses. One is through the engineering lens. They provide engineering services that would be very costly and difficult to obtain. And I think that's also true in agricultural landscapes. Uh, the, the, the wetland and the drainage across, um, across much of the prairies is actually natural infrastructure. And the other piece, it's not just the engineering piece, it's, as, Chief, as Vice Chief Heather Bear says, it's also about what that means to the people. And in cities, uh, natural infrastructure also has a really important cultural service for people in cities. It's associated with identity. It's associated with our sense of, of who we are in cities. And I think um, there's something also to leverage there. The infrastructure has multiple purposes and realities, and perhaps using that lens might help in agricultural places. Thank you. There's a lot of talk in the chat also about perverse incentives. And a couple of the policy instruments identified include crop insurance and tax assessments. So I'm wondering from our illustrious panel here, if they see these as perverse incentives to valuation of, of ecosystem services, water and land uh, functions, and if they think anything can be done about it. I, I would come in there. I think um, from a, uh, the crop insurance gets labeled on the perverse incentive. I don't think that comes into people's decision making enough to matter. I think that if we're, that if we're gonna invest energy in wetland policy, we need to look at the, the bigger ticket item one of, one of the big perverse incentives actually is was encouraging autosphere where it really, really is expensive to turn around. Um, so people plowed their wetlands in order to accommodate autosphere and the autosphere was part paid for through, through stewardship money. But, um, but I think that the order of magnitude of both the perverse incentives on crop insurance and on is, is not uh, sufficient. And I think as a society, we have to be willing to consider higher tax levels in order to start to buy the public goods that we want to buy in real terms. And uh, somehow that discussion has fallen off when there's public goods, um, they need to get paid for by the public sector and they need to be prioritized. And I recognize landowners need to be um, stopped from doing some of the illegal activity, 
Um, but the economics of growing a crop in a lot of those wetlands, independent of crop insurance or, or valuation from the, the tax assessment is what's driving. Thanks for that. There have been a couple comments in the chat around making cultural change and education. So how do we how do we value ecosystem services? And I'm thinking specifically Alice and Oralee around our Great Lakes and our water bodies and how much enjoyment the public gets from these summers and winters. So how do we get the public goods valued? Potentially economic uh, getting the message out to people of the value of our water, our water bodies. Hey, Margo. Uh, yeah, I'll bounce in on that. Uh, um, yeah, our tourist industry is really, really important to us in the Coppell Valley. And if you go down Main Street in Fort Coppell and that water is green, those, those businesses know exactly how much they're losing on green days. Um, so if we could come together, as Chief Heather Barris said, and in a holistic way, listen to each other's words that um, we we do impact each other and how do we how do we live in a peaceful way and right now just as larry uh, larry has mentioned is without regulation and without policy um we don't have a chance we really need um we re we really need to have a solid wetland policy and we are the last one in canada to have a wetland policy. So like, what is going on? And so I don't understand why the government just can't pick up the phone and phone PEI or Alberta or Manitoba and say, what are you doing? Let, let's get going on this because um, what we're about to face, our farmers will not survive and we need all our industries to be successful. Thank you. There's an interesting article in the paper uh, today around uh, nitrous oxide and one cultural producer changing his fertilization practices. And he admits that he actually didn't know about some of these contaminants and greenhouse gases that are the most lethal beyond carbon, um, carbon dioxide. I'm wondering what people think about monitoring verification and reporting schemes around some of the issues we have in water quality and climate change and whether they see it as a benefit to advance the actual monitoring verification and accounting of greenhouse gases, CO2, water pollutants on the land uh, and rewarding things that actually keep soil absorbing CO2, so valuing those perennial crops that are working on our soil quality and making payments to agriculture producers around that. And perhaps the opposite, which is if waterlands are drained, fining or taxing based on the loss of nature's contribution to people of those services. I think it has to be part of the solution. It's an important part of the solution. Thanks, Ian. And do you think it's feasible on a prairie landscape? Absolutely. No, if we can do big data. Uh, we can do big data in other realms. Can we not do big data in agriculture? Can we not send the same uh, kind of, if you like, armies of, of, of data technicians out there to measure and monitor and capture a profile of this landscape. I mean, I hope in the ideal world, evidence actually supports decisions. So the more evidence, the more data, can it not only be beneficial? I think like the, the approach of the carrot or the stick, which is uh, basically what you're suggesting here, Margo, I'm not sure which one is, is better. Um, I think sometimes when you use a stick, you get more resistance. But um, ultimately, I think it boils down to economics 
for you know in, in the ag uh, in the ag landscapes, and you know what 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 Paul mentioned about those messy areas, uh, and you know as I showed in my presentation, a lot of those messy areas just aren't economical to farm, and so there's actually a benefit, an economic benefit for producers to do something better with it, whether it's to restore wetlands, whether it's to put them into some kind of perennial cover or, or other management. Unfortunately, I would I would say that there's probably some messy areas that are actually quite productive that you know that might be considered uh, you know good potential for ecological goods, uh, but are actually still quite uh, economically advantageous. And so those are the, the the trickier areas I think that we have to deal with. Uh, and if, if you are going to change what's happening on those those parts of the landscape. That's going to take some. Uh, that's going to, uh, like, like you had mentioned earlier, I think some probably some public support there. And Mark, I just, Mark, can I just bounce in on there? Just to, I, I think the messy. Oh, sorry. I think the messy areas have to not just be on the farmland. I think the messy areas need to also be around, um, around uh, resort villages. Um, we we have this idea in our head. The culture is, you know, you want the the white picket fence and the lawn, but that that is not going to sustain us to where we need to go. So the messy areas, I think, need to splash out to the city, um, the resorts. Um, they need to be incorporated almost into every part of our life if um, if we want to get to where we're going to to move forward. Uh, this is a uh, Renee Carrier up in the Saskatchewan uh, River Delta, and I agree it needs to expand beyond that because we have, um, you know, million dollar industries that are uh, beyond resort villages. These are our homelands as well, and uh, they need to be within that um, landscape. So I made a comment about the prairie landscape needs to be expanded. Uh, we have a delta landscape. We have a wetland landscape that we're living in. People are living in. I'm looking out my front window and I'm right in the heartland of the Saskatchewan River Delta. So the vocabulary um, and the, uh, the vision of that landscape needs to be um, greatly um, expanded upon. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering going forward, if we were to be thinking about this vision for a resilient water in the future, what would we be looking at in terms of the landscape? Would it be messy areas? Would it be indicators of human health? And how would we bring this discussion into the future? Uh, there's a uh, paper that was out, I think it's called Healthy Rivers Make Healthy Communities, and I argue that healthy wetlands make healthy communities, and that's the beyond, of course, the communities of people, but it's the entire ecosystems that are involved. And Vice Chief Heather Bear, perhaps um, some last closing remarks as we're getting close to our time for ending. How do we how do we move forward in working and protecting and acknowledging the treaties with building water resiliency into the future and engaging Indigenous communities in this idea of a healthy water resiliency in the future? Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I I think uh, uh, and as I pointed to uh, previous, you know, when we look at consultation uh, with our, our First Nations, uh, our partners, uh, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, the chiefs, we have tribal councils, we have FSIN, we have First Nations uh, bands, we have a uh, institute, the Center of Excellence. Um, you know, these types, the, these are, are the, the first, I guess, stops when we look at, uh, you know, what do we think and how can we better work together? Uh, one of the areas that we lack and we struggle with capacity, financial capacity, 
uh, when we look at engaging and, and uh, mobilizing our people, uh, you know, it's sad, the blood in the bones of our ancestors are in the wealth of this land. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, struggle day to day, uh, whether it's uh, livelihood, whether it's, uh, you know, the social issues. And uh, uh, many times we're, we're taken away uh, or there's a, a capacity is put in other areas. So we need uh, special capacity. Uh, I think government has to uh, take some responsibility and uh, the fiduciary responsibility is there uh, to provide that so that we can have these wholesome con conversations and work together, whether we uh, work together co-managing and, you know, stewardship is something, you know, we, we, we need to work together on. And uh, uh, we have other, uh, other issues when it comes to hunting, fishing and gathering. And we're, we're talking about uh, our inherent rights and treaty rights here and, and uh, uh, a lot of infringements um, and uh, we need to put all those arguments aside, aside uh, for the sake of protecting, you know, what we have here and preserving what we have here and also fixing, uh, you know, the contamination, you know, all these transgressions uh, of the past. But we need to sit down, talk with our leadership. They're the ones that are, uh, uh, have, you um, uh, contact with their elders, their community, and uh, they know really know what's going on. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. And last question, both to the entire panel is, this is, are we in a state of climate crisis that some Nobel Prize winners, such as Joseph Stiglitz, is comparing to a world war? And is this the time to start thinking about carbon rationing and getting serious about the protection of our water and land? Well, that's a big one. And I, uh, I, um, I, I think we are in a crisis and I think we have, um, a very limited time to make huge progress um, or else the consequences start to get dramatically worse. I'm working with a group of farmers from across Canada called Farmers for Climate Solutions to try and put some proposals forward to government to say, um, here are some things that we could do within agriculture to, to try and get those greenhouse gases down. Uh, we're looking at sort of the first cut of policies that could be there. Uh, I think within that group, there's wide recognition that there needs to be a second and third cut in order to get to where we need to go. But part of that has to be a culture change because we really need to, um, I mean, we live in a province that, that still doesn't uh, treat it at the level that this discussion is putting it at. And so we need to have some pretty serious education processes to what the impacts of our actions are to be it storms in the Indian Ocean or be it uh, other events that are happening around the world. So I think, I think it is urgent and I think um, we better work together collectively on this one. Some comments and some good ideas. I'm uh, glad the discussion in Saskatchewan around agriculture and climate change is proceeding. It's an important uh, discussion. Okay, thank you for our panelists, uh, Vice Chief Bear, Ora Lee, Alice, Larry, Paul, and Ian, once again, for your insight and interesting presentations. And thank you to the audience member for joining us here today. Thank you for the chat. I've been keeping my eye on it. It's uh, an incredibly rich chat. Thank you to my fellow organizers. We've got Chuck Deschamps from Ducks Unlimited Canada, Roger Petri, the Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development, RCE Saskatchewan, and Orly McPherson Saskatchewan Alliance for Water Sustainability. I also would like to thank all of the organizations and supporters of this event. You can see their names and logos on the slide that is being shared. They were a there were a lot of organizations who are excited to have today's discussion. It's the start of a discussion. We want to keep the memento going. Thank you for spreading word about today's 
lecture. Uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, I encourage you to join us at these upcoming presentations that JSGS is hosting November 4th, Saskatchewan's municipal elections, why should you care? November 5th, Ray Dawn in Saskatchewan, public attention influencing policy in November 5th, the 2020 US election. I know we're all gonna go running to our uh, news radio after this uh, to see what's going on. What happens now? So that's November 5th. Please look at JSGS online events calendar and join me in a round of applause for our speakers. Uh, using Zoom's reaction option for our panel, a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you for many wonderful questions. I hope I did a good job summarizing them, and I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Uh, we'll keep this momentum and discussion going. Thank you. Have a great day.